uh, to the Nambi talk show. Uh, ever since I learned that I'll be having this privilege of hosting His Excellency, President Museveni, I have been, I've called this, this interview of a lifetime. He's a person who has inspired many, a man from a small village of Rashtra to a world-renowned person. This platform, as you know, we bring on people to inspire, motivate, and educate us about issues today of national development, fighting poverty, and uh, we're going to also talk about the president as a person. What efforts have the government put in place to fight poverty? The first element of our struggle against poverty is first of all peace, to ensure that there is peace in Uganda. Yes. Secondly, liberalization. We liberalize the economy so that those who have got, uh, who are gifted and are able to take the initiative, move forward without being uh, inhibited by government uh, bottlenecks. In the past, there were government bottlenecks. Example, yes. there was coffee marketing board, which monopolized the business in coffee. There was another group called coffee marketing board, uh, no, no, cotton marketing, uh, lint marketing board, that one also monopolized the trade in the, the cotton. Then there were government transport companies which monopolized the transport. Uh, there was also a government airline yes. which monopolized the air transport. We removed all this, we removed all this, and we said let the private people do it. So that liberalization was another element in fighting uh, poverty. Then education, because uh, one of the problems that causes poverty is really ignorance. So if people are ignorant, they don't know what to, how to do things, they will not know how to move. We, we introduced uh, education for all at the primary school level and recently at the secondary school level. Then infrastructure. Because you need electricity to produce something. Yes. We are now struggling to make sure to produce more electricity uh, so that it is cheaper for business people to do business. Now, finally, we have also done direct interventions uh, through, for instance, NADS. Yes. Uh, apart from providing this infrastructure, uh, creating the atmosphere, we even go to the homestead and assist them so that they can uh, start producing in, in, in commercial ways. These are some of the interventions we have done on the side of poverty. So we take an exhaustive list, yes. but it's uh, uh, indicative of the efforts we have. Your Excellency, comment about corruption among the public service. Corruption is a big problem, uh, but it will be solved. You know we had uh, so many problems in Uganda. For instance, we had extrajudicial killings. We are soldiers, we are killing people with the impunity. That will always stop. Yes. You don't hear that soldiers are killing people. Why have we stop it? By punishing harshly the soldiers who, who, who would kill people. Now, the problem with corruption is that corruption is covert, it's not open. It's, it's not as overt as killing somebody. If you kill somebody, we see it, and we know that you have killed somebody, and we act against you. It is simpler. It is clearer. Yes. So, so what uh, uh, stopping extrajudicial killings required was political will. Yes. And we had plenty of it. But fighting co corruption which is covert now. You have the will to fight it, but you must know who has stolen and how he stole. Yes. Uh, 
so that you are able to to get him. Put him to court. Yes. Uh, therefore, in addition to political will, we are to, to involve an investigative capacity. Fortunately, uh, we say in our languages here, in the Ogwangazi, but we say Messi, <laughs> which means that um, longevity yes. enables the, the right to, 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 to know, to eat the, the, the skin of the, of the cat. Why did the cat in the orange juice to eat the, the rat when it was alive? Uh, because the other man stayed in power for a long time. As but, long as I've lived. Yes. <laughs> you, you people who have grown up. Yes. Thank you very much, <laughs> Your Excellency. People like nine here. Yes. Who were not born or were babies. <laughs> they are now mature. And, yes, sir. And, and these have got a totally different attitude from our traditional civil servants. We have, for instance, created uh, an inspection unit yes. in my office. To, to track stealing of drugs. And this inspection, this inspection unit is now manned by people like you. Only that they are doctors. These are young doctors who are training our time. They are highly qualified now. We have now unleashed them to fight this corruption in drugs and in the year what will happen there. So therefore, we are going to defeat the corruption. Yes. Like we defeated the extrajudicial killings. Like we defeated the killings of the Wanaiji by the soldiers. Yes. We are going to defeat this corruption. It is there, it's very strong, it is pervasive, but we shall defeat it. Because, because now we have the manpower yes. with which to defeat, to defeat it. Your Excellency, what should the young generation, people like me, uh, you have a lot of capital in us. <laughs> we've grown up under your leadership and we've been at peace. Thank you so much. What message do you have for the young generation as a part of the struggle, really? We do not know where we've come from, but where should we go? The, the message for the young people, first of all, there is a Nyangori problem which says, I'm, I'm saying this in connection with the previous question. Yes. Uh, the, the proverb says, a white hog is engine, which has got young ones, the young ones will defend it when the dogs come to eat it. You, the young ones, you, you must defend the revolution. Because this, this piece you have here, this development, when you see a man like this, uh, but I'm to give you such a big unit here. Yes. Uh, it is because of the atmosphere which the NRM has created. Yes. So what, what is the challenge of the young, of the young people? First of all, you must understand where you came from. It is not enough to say, I was not there when Uganda was suffering. I was not there when Jesus was crucified. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but if you ask me, I will tell you the story as if I was there. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I will tell you when Jesus was in the, in the garden of, of this man, how he moved, how he carried the cross, how he could not carry it, how he was helped by somebody else. I will tell you the story as if I was there. So the challenge you have is first of all to know your history. Yes. You, you young Ugandans, you Nandi, <laughs> you all these young people are here. Yes. Where did you come from? You are Ugandans, but what stages did your Uganda go through? So you cannot say, I don't know, because I was not there. Because well, knowledge is power. Once you know, then you can know what to do. Yes. Second, discipline. Mwekune. Do not allow yourself to suffer from babies. Mm -hmm. This is the second requirement. Third, you are educated. Now, if you studied a, a course which does not have 
the job market, which is not required in the job market, go back and start another course. There are courses which are marketable. The hospitality industry, like this one here, has got a very big market, like this hotel. Uh, the nursing, bachelor of nursing, oh, I don't want to talk about medicine. Business administration, accountancy, science. Now, once you start a business administration, then you can start your own business. Or you work for somebody, and once you have accumulated enough money, you, you are able to start your own business. So therefore, those three things, to know where you came from, to protect your life, and to ensure that you have got a, a skill required in the job market, either here in Uganda, or in the region, or internationally. Your Excellency, uh, you've been an author of uh, some of must read books, Sowing the Mustard Seed, and What Are Africa's Problems. Uh, about sowing the mustard seed, uh, you planted a seed on fertile soil. Uh, it has germinated. Should we harvest, or we still have a way to go? No, we are beginning to harvest. Like, for instance, for, for instance, we are harvesting in Nandi, what she's doing here. <laughs> So. This is harvesting uh, because you have you, been educated. Yes. Uh, it is that this, this girl was young, you know, in the bush. That's why I came to her shop. When I had it, she was the one. <laughs> Thank uh, you, sir. I came to miss because she was a baby with us in the bush, in the corner. And her sister was born there. Yes. In fact, me, I thought it was the sister. <laughs> this one was one year old or something like that. So now you are grown up, you are educated, you are able now to, to take part uh, in, 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 in building your country. Yes. By production, by business, by contributing to the ideas <coughs> of the country. This is the time for Amakungula, for the harvest. I totally agree with you. Uh, and in this book, I've read it several times. Uh, do you have you say that your biggest um, likings is to do with your cows, that you consider them like your sisters and your brothers. Is this true? I found it in some page here. That's true. And like the, the, the Frisians are like adopted sons that's from, that's, from that's, some. That's very true because the, uh, the cows which I have, I didn't buy them. They have been in my family for the last 1,000 years <laughs> or more. So when I, am, when I was young, I knew this cow, then it, it's children, it's grandchildren. Uh, so they are like my sisters and brothers. They, they are not just cows. They are part of my family. Yes. That's very true. Yes. And what was your main uh, message in what is Africa's problems? The main message is that, you know, there is a process in biology called metamorphosis. This is the process where the, the insect goes through different life forms. It's, it starts as a, an egg, yes. becomes a caterpillar, a pupa, and a mature butterfly. Similarly, society goes through metamorphosis. The European society has gone through metamorphosis in the last 500 years, from feudal society, peasant society, to a middle class, skilled, working class society. Africa must do the same. That's what I was talking about. Yes. I was saying that the problem of Africa yes. is that it has not yet gone through a social metamorphosis, and it, it must do so. How do how does society go through social metamorphosis? Education is one. Second, when you no longer depend on agriculture only, but you start depending on industries, 
and services like this hotel here, then that's part of the metamorphosis. That's part of the chain. And even in agriculture, it should not be, uh, what do they call it, uh, uh, subsistence agriculture. Agriculture just for eating, producing what you eat. Uh, but agriculture, we should produce what you eat, yes. but also producing what you can sell. Uh, commercial agriculture that will give you money. So to, uh, your home, uh, your, your family has got income, uh, has got food security and income security. Uh, Your Excellency, congratulations. I don't know whether it's the first phase of regional cooperation. You, you wrote about it many years ago. Uh, how far have you gone on that front? We have been able to revive the East African community. And the East African community has now been expanded with Rwanda and Burundi. And we now have reached the stage of a common market. So what you produce here can be sold in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Rwanda, in Burundi. So we have moved and we are going towards an East African Federation. So to have brought one country in the whole of East Africa. This process, this process is very good for business people. Yes. If you have got the whole of East Africa for which you are producing, yes. then you have got a bigger market. Me who is producing milk at the White Tour. East Africa is a, is a bigger market for me than just Uganda. So this is very exciting for you young people. Yes. Uh, you need a better uh, atmosphere in which you can struggle to improve your, to improve your lives through business and through production. I think in the world of living heroes, you stand, Your Excellency. What, <laughs> what are some of your characteristic traits that you can say, one I think is you believe in yourself. <laughs> How did you tell those people who told you, no, you're supposed to just keep cattle here? How did you deal with that? <laughs> well, first of all, cattle keeping is, uh, we regard ourselves as very rich people <laughs> because we have cows. Yes. Well, so we didn't think that we had any problem. But the problem was that, uh, and we had a lot of cows always, but the problem was that our level of technology was low. We were producing, but at a low level of production. So what helped us was education. Those cows enabled my father to educate me. Now, once I got education, I could see where the problems were. I saw the need for this transformation I was telling you about, yes. for this metamorphosis. Yes. You don't keep cows like the Karamajong or like the Maasai or like we were doing in the past. You do it in a modern way. So that was stage number one. Modernize our agriculture. But secondly, how do you modernize agriculture? If you have got bad governance in the whole country, if people are dying. Now, those country people are very tough people. They are very tough, they are brave. So when, when I came first, first with this um, uh, oppression which was going on, yes. the killings which were, which were taking place, I, I was able to say, but why should these people kill us? Yes. These soldiers who are killing people, why, why, why do we allow them to kill us? <clears throat> they are human beings, we are human beings. We shall fight them. Didn't people tell you that you can't? How did you handle that? Because uh, <laughs> do you just ignore them? <laughs> you handling your vision to move yourself forward. I, I, I have this inner belief that this man who is killing us is a human being like me. And yes. He has no right to kill us. And if he's using the gun to kill us, I can also manage that gun. So that was my fault. My fault. So you believed in yourself? Yes. Believed in myself, in ourselves. We. Uh, and I was able to inspire my, 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 my colleagues, your parents, and your, your mother was with us. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Your father. Yes. Uh, your Excellency, how do you handle loss? You've suffered an amount of loss, and you said in one of your books, Sowing the Master Seed, that this, uh, this platform for you is national sacrifice, mm -hmm. endless sacrifice. Mm -hmm. 
How do you handle loss? Loss, you must handle it philosophically. Because dying, you shall all die. Where's my great grandfather? He's not here, he died. Yes. Where's my grandfather? He's not here, he died. My father is still alive, he's 92 years old, but he's still alive. Uh, so we shall all die. So therefore dying is, is, is really normal. Yes. The question is, when, how do you die? Now, if what we were faced with that time was humiliation and uh, total devaluation of life. Yes. You could be walking on the street and you are gunned down. You could be having a car and they come and kill you for the car and, and take it away. So that's why we said, okay, if you are going to die, uh, we better die fighting. So even when somebody died, okay. here we put it in the context and said, uh, put it in the context and said that yes, he has died, but he has died making it easier for us to live, or our children, to live a better life. And you can see how we are living here. We are just spoiled. Uh, the parties, you don't know what problems are. That's what we are fighting for, that you are happy. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Your Excellency, I'm going to mention three people, and you tell me what comes to your mind. Mr. Julius Nyelene. Julius Nyelene was uh, a great Pan-Africanist. <coughs> you are talking about believing in ourselves. By 1961, the whole of Southern Africa was still under the control of the colonialists. Mozambique, was under the Portuguese, Rhodesia, under the Ian Smith, Angola, under the Portuguese, Southwest Africa, under the African, the, the, the Boers, the old Boers, the, the, the whites of South Africa. Yes. South Africa itself, under the Boers. Then he said, no, we must liberate the whole of Southern Africa. And those people are not willing to give independence. But the United said, no, we shall support the freedom fighters to liberate Southern Africa. So, and we shall use force. And at that time, people did not believe that Africans would defeat Europeans. The war started in 1964 in, uh, in uh, Mozambique. Yes. By Frelimo. And by 1974, the Portuguese were defeated in Mozambique and in Angola. So Mozambique became free, Angola became free. By 1980, Ian Smith was defeated. By 1995, the Boers in South Africa were defeated. So now, then it came to the side of Uganda. When Idi Amin was killing us, one of the people who stood with us was Julius, Julius Nyerere. So Julius Nyerere is a great man, he did a lot of things in his own country, but he also did even more in the African continent. So he's a, he's a in fact for me I see Julius Nyerere is the greatest black man yes. that has ever ever lived since the beginning of the <laughs> Another one is uh, Mr. Nelson Mandela. Mandela is in a different category from <laughs> um, from Yes. yes. <laughs> Mandela was more of a martyr. A martyr. Nyerere was a, a fighter. Mandela started as a, a fighter, but unfortunately he was captured by the whites. Yes. They captured him. They put him in jail. Yes. In jail. He had the possibility of breaking down and siding with the oppressor. But he, he became now the mother. He said, I will not break down. Yes. If you want to kill me, you kill me. But I will not side with you. 27 years, the man was in jail. 
So, you is a great hero, just like he really, but a hero now in Matabu. Yes. Because he, he refused to, to break down, although he was under the total control of these people, of his enemies. Yes. His enemies were with him. They tried to break him down, but he, 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 he refused and, uh, until they gave up and they had to negotiate with him. And that's, that's how South Africa got the majority of rule. Honorable Janet Museveni. And she's uh, the mother of my children, and the grandmother of my, of my grandchildren. Uh, she had been with, with me when I was fighting. You, 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 she was not uh, with us in the bush, but she, she went to Kenya first of all then to Sweden with the children. Uh, she looked after the children when I, when I was not there. Uh, then when we came out of the, of the fighting, uh, she brought them up. And now that she's a grandmother, she said, let me go and help the community. <laughs> she's helping Rahama, mm -hmm. helping uh, Karamoja now. Yes. She's a, she's a great lady, very, very systematic in her work. Yes. Uh, I, I, I salute her contribution. <laughs> your Excellency, what are some of your human values that others can learn from you? First of all, being firm in your beliefs, having very strong convictions. What you are asking about, why could we do, how could we do all this? Yes. It is because of the strength of conviction. Uh, if you have got somebody who is just like a, a flag, the wind comes, it blows this way. The wind changes the direction, it goes that way. That's not a good quality. Yes. The, the, the quality of steadfastness, mm -hmm. being steadfast, being firm in your belief. But you cannot be firm in your beliefs unless you understand deeply. You must have depth of understanding an issue in order to say, no, 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 this one, I would rather die. If you don't have that uh, um, certainty that you are right, then you cannot be so strong in your, in your conviction. So, steadfastness is one quality. Never going behind people. Yes. If there is anything you don't like about somebody, you should take it straight away. Say, I, and that's why for us, yes, we have never fought anybody without warning you. Yes. We may want to. These who are old enough know when we warn the UPC that if you don't stop doing this, we are going to fight you. Never go behind. Never go behind your friends. Or anybody, never go behind anybody. Always say what you mean and mean what you say. Hard work. You must work hard. Don't be lazy. Don't be vindictive. So and so did this to me, I must uh, no, no. If somebody did something, it is over, it is over. I could go on and on, but <laughs> these are some of the points. Your Excellency, in sowing the mustard seed, you laid out a program, the 10-point program. Is it still the 10-point program? What is the vision from today for this country? What's the vision going forward? Now we are in 2009. The most important point was point number five, and that's 10-point program. Yes. We talked of building an independent, integrated, self-sustaining economy. Yes. Now, that's what we are working on even now. When you look at this hotel, Africana, this is put up by the Ugandan. Yes. By, this hotel is in the service sector. Yes. If you go inside, 
or even here, you see we are using electricity. Where is this electricity coming from? From Ginga. So, electricity, power with the hotel. If you go upstairs, you eat food. Where is that food coming from? From our farmers. Maybe he has got, uh, I'm sure he has got uh, equipment, like uh, textiles and so on. If some of them are coming from Ugandan factories, this is the integration we are talking about. The hotel, the service sector integrated yes. with the industrial sector, linked, integration means linked. Agriculture is now linked with this hotel by supplying it food. So, your question is, are you still with the 10 point programs? Yes, they were the core, the core uh, principles. The rest is adding on, adding on. Along the same lines. Along the same lines. Uh, if, you, if you understood our culture, there's what we call in Uganda and Tomo. This is the nucleus of a, of a basket. Yes. Now, in Nyakwe, they call it a tango. Now, that's the nucleus. Those principles are the nucleus. Yes. The rest is adding on. Adding on the coins so that the basket is, is complete. So every milestone starts as a dream. Uh, Mr. President, did you dream of the special man you are today? No, I, 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 I didn't believe to, I, I did not dream to become a big man. I, I dreamed to, to have justice. And justice led me to the struggle, and the struggle produced it. His Excellency. <laughs> Comment about the reading culture in Uganda. The reading, essence of reading. Reading is very, very, very important. Reading is very important. Uh, I, I read a lot. If you come to my library, I, I have a lot of books, especially military books. Uh, these are the ones I enjoy. I watch some channels in TV, mainly two channels. History channel is a channel called History Channel. Another one called uh, National Geographic Channel. Yes. These are very educative. Uh, I used to watch Discovery Channel, but it's now no longer as, as educative as it used to be. So reading is very, very important. Reading is irrigation for knowledge. You must always irrigate your knowledge. And put water so that you will keep fresh and informed. Do you think uh, adults have fully told us where you people are coming from? Not, not, uh, I don't think they have done enough. Otherwise, you need to be so confused running up and down. So it's true, and, and, and I'm glad you invited me here. This is part of the exposure. You should interact more with the, the, the elders uh, so that you know yes. where you came from. Mm -hmm. they have not, we have not done enough. It's true. We have been busy fighting up to now. But now I have time. I'll come back. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, and as a president of Uganda, people look at the, 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 the entourage of cars. We look at the red carpet. We look at the flags. Uh, a comment about the sacrifice that a person in, with your responsibilities and duties has to face. I mean, people think being a leader in any field, it's just about sitting comfortably and, I mean, the national sacrifice that you have to endure. But I mentioned it in that book that if you go into leadership in order to get benefits, that means you are not a good leader. Uh, I don't have to be a leader of Uganda to, to get what to eat. In case you want to confirm that, you come to, to my tutorial and you see that I don't, I don't need to be in leadership in order to, to, to feed myself. Yes. So leadership is really a sacrifice. That's why some time ago I used the imagery of Oribeengo, carrying a big load. Yes. Uh, it is, uh, for instance, I used to be a footballer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I no longer play football because I don't have the time. I don't have the time. Uh, I don't rest. I'm always working. 
I don't have time to see my grandchildren or even my cows. I, I, I only go there like four times a year. So it's a very big sacrifice. Leadership is a sacrifice. Should we say that as others wake up to theory or you wake up to problems? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. That's what it is. But it's a pleasure because by solving those problems, uh, it's like a doctor, when you, if, if you treat a patient and the patient uh, is cured, yes. then you are happy. You, you, you are fulfilled in the results of your work. Your Excellency, do you have mentors, people who have impacted so much on your life? Uh, maybe by reading, yes. People like Julius Nyerere, whom you are talking about. Not, not mentors in the sense of being behind me and doing what to do. But uh, people who, who, who contributed yes. to my conviction. Yes. So there's Julius Nyerere and? There are others, Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon was a, uh, an African revolutionary in the Caribbean. Uh, Many African leaders, our colleagues. Okay. Uh, comment about uh, parenting, the need for fathers to step up and do their part parenting today. You should, I, I treat my children as my, my comrades, even when they are young. I have never, I have never backed at a child. All is there like my comrades, uh, my friends. I think, I think that's good. You, you develop a bondage with these children and understanding between you and them. Uh, Your Excellency, you're a father of 32 million people. So give us some words of wisdom. Don't be greedy for life. Don't, don't be greedy. Uh, there is time for everything. Yes. Do what you are supposed to do. When you are in school, study. When you are in school, do, do four things. Read your books. Read your Bible, your Quran. Do sports or exercise all to your feet, and when you go home, help your parents. Four things. I've not added, I've not added, as you can see, looking for boyfriends and girlfriends, that will come, <laughs> that will come at the right time. Uh, Your Excellency, are you op optimistic about the future of this country? Oh, I am very optimistic. <laughs> Uganda is taking off. It's now because our GDP has now gone up to almost uh, 30 uh, trillion. Our children have gone to school. There are so many educated people. We have got 8 million children in the primary school, and that, 1 million in the secondary schools. University is almost half a million. That means almost one third of the population of Uganda are now in schools. We had some problems with, with the electricity and so on, but now we are building more down. And with this oil, the future is bright for you. With the peace, we have defeated the coal, we have brought uh, stability to Karamoja. The future is definitely very bright for, for Uganda and for you. Thank you. This is the Nambi Talk Show. We'll be right back. Please don't go. Uh, we're going to have questions from the audience. We are starting from Ms. with Mr. David Eckerson, uh, Director of International Development from USID. I didn't think I'd be asking you a question today. Thank you for letting me. You've done an amazing job in terms of ensuring access to all Ugandans for, for primary education and health services. You've done an amazing job creating the climate for rapid economic growth. However, Uganda is now facing a population growth rate of 3.2%. Findings from the recent conference that was held in Kampala last week suggest 
that with the population growth rate that your country has right now, it could have a devastating impact on all that you've done in terms of ensuring access to essential services and economic growth. My question, Your Excellency, do you feel that you must do more to curb population growth in Uganda? I know that the theory of getting uh, worried about the population rate of growth, but I'm not worried myself. <laughs> the, it will sort itself, it will sort itself out. The, the rate of growth is 3.2% as you say, the population rate of growth. Okay, that's a bit high by, by other standards. But our rate of economic growth the other year was 9%. And once we have finished with our electricity and transport, our rate of growth will go to 11, 13 percent. So why should I worry if the rate of growth of the population is 3.2 percent? The rate of growth is 11 percent or 13 percent, which I'm sure we shall achieve. In the, in the electricity, uh, cheaper electricity and, uh, and, and, and better transport. We will be having the rates of growth of 8%, 9%, 7%. Uh, the problem of electricity. So I, I'm not worried about the population rate of growth. Uh, it will stabilize. Once people are going to school, like this one who are going to school, you know, you don't have many children. <laughs> they have no time to. They want time to go to, to, to the bar, to the hotel, to, to the fields. The ones who are, who are having many children are the peasants, many, the people in the rural areas. So once our people become educated as they are, as they are to be, it will stabilize. Besides, when I was growing up in 1961, the population of the United States where you come from was 170 million. I don't know if you remember. I do remember, sir. In 1961. The population is now, the population of the United States is now 316 million. Have you disappeared? It has gone up, but you are, you are still prospering. The population of China, in 1962, uh, was 650 million. It's now 1.3 billion. And they are now all more prosperous. India, India in 1964, five, there was 430 million. It's now 1.2 billion, 1.1 billion. In the UK, in 1810, population was 10 million. There was a man called Alfred Marthas. He was very worried about population growth. And he talked of, of the population growing uh, ge geometrically. Why food production was growing arithmetically. Population of the UK is now 60 million people. And they are now more prosperous than they were when they were only 10 million in 1810. So, population with growth is not a problem, number one. And second, it will stabilize. It will, it will, the rate of growth will decline with education. So that's my plan. It is a systemic plan, not, not just a tackling on one side. When you live, there was the one person who was there frustrating many somewhere <laughs> in one place that I don't want to mention that they were controlling the population but they did it. It must be through extension and through change, through change of, of, of attitudes of the population. That's what we are working for. Great. Thank you, Excellency. Yes, hello. My name is Tony Lennart. I'm the International Chairman of the Institute of Advanced Leadership. I've trained about five people who report directly to you as well as many others in Africa. 
Uh, my question is to do with corruption. Uh, but l let me just spend one minute. You asked the question why we would worry about population growth. My concern is that those countries you described have recognized they were getting overpopulated and come back to around about two children per family, which means a replacement value. Whereas in Uganda, in 40 years, you will have four times as many people as now. That means Kampala Road needs to be 24 lanes. That means that Nessa Road needs to be, uh, what is it, about uh, 18 lanes. That means that Speak Road needs to be uh, 16 lanes. Uh, surely, when there is only so many land and you want to pass on your cows and your land to your family, if you now have 49 grandchildren because you had seven children and they each had seven, surely that's going to create problems. But the main question that I wanted to ask was to do with corruption. I think you must be very proud of the fact that your contribution, uh, your support, your training, your empowerment and opportunities for Paul Kagame have enabled him to be where he is and to create very major changes in terms of fighting corruption in Rwanda. I'm interested what you have learnt from uh, Paul Kagame in terms of attitudes, approach, in terms of methodologies, in terms of what he's doing, uh, which could then be applied to Uganda. Thank you very much. Uh, what I know is that Rwanda is different from Uganda. The, the history is a bit different. Oh, they are our people. They are very close with us, culturally. But they have got different experiences. So, here, we started first with exploit. You see, we had, we had many problems. The one problem we started with was extrajudicial killings. Not many people forget this. especially by the army. That's what we struggled with and finished. As I said at the beginning, corruption is not overt like killing. So that's why you need a different approach. Uh, and we are, we are leading there. We are leading there through investigation, through uh, changing the attitude of the judiciary, uh, so I understand how they did it in Rwanda, I, I know how we, we, we have done it here and how we shall do it. But, but uh, for the population again, remember that Africa, the continent of Africa, the main problem up to now has actually been underpopulation. You are African, like you, you are an African. These are all African. They all come from here. All, all, all human beings started here. Four million years ago. Now, these, were, these whites and all these Chinese and Indians, these are Africans who left 100,000 years ago. Although our 
Commission has gone up to now almost 1 billion now, 150 million. But they even more. And they are living in an area which is one level of Africa. You get a country like Congo. Congo is about the same size as India. But they are going to live. It's also not good for development. It's not good at all. You can tell me that 50 million people in a land area which is the size of, of India is, is good even for economy. How about Australia? We only have 20 million. Australia is a desert. <laughs> Australia is mainly a desert with some kangaroos. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Akavanda Muhammad. I'm, I'm the headman of Chitimba Primary School in PG District. Mine is about putting their vocational uh, schools, especially during holidays. The children, during holidays, they love the ball. They go and learn how to make bricks, sewing, tree planting, and extra. And these children can always stop being criminals. Another one is about nationalism and patriotism. Mr. President, I'm advising you to put a, put a curriculum caters for patriotism and nationalism right away from primary to the university. I think that will contribute to the development of Uganda. Uh, Mr. President, another thing is about putting a law on absenteeism of pupils in schools. You spend there a lot of money in primary schools and secondary schools, but the people in the villages there have stay have experienced that these children do not come to school due to some problems and there are no laws there. Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> On absenteeism of children in school, you have, you see, you have to use education. Because now, who will you, who will you lock up? I will lock up the child. For the parents, it's a bit tricky. It's a bit tricky. If it is the parents who stop, if it is the parents who stop the child, maybe you could punish them. But the child may run away by himself, herself, or himself. So it's a bit uh, tricky. But I know it's a problem. But I wouldn't quickly rush to say. Put a law, a law to do what? The issue must uh, run. Certain things you do because you don't know right. And you need to use that system. But the second point was about uh, putting patriotism in the curriculum. I, I totally agree with you. And I've already started. That's why we started the patriotism club in schools. That's a good Third point was vocation. So I do agree with you. Uh, in fact, you must know that we are what we call bit v. Bit v. Business, technical, vocational, education training. This is available for free in, in government technical. Institutes, technical colleges, polytechnics, vocational schools available in many parts of the country. And we are going to increase these schools and we are also going to um, equip them better. So we are already moving in that direction. It is one of my greatest honors of my career to have interviewed you, Your Excellency. Mamo Abana, Hajit Nam Farid, Uganda is proud of you. Uganda.